Hi, my name is Tracy Whitefoot um, and I'm here um, at Gedlin Country Park. I think just over my shoulder you can probably just start to uh, see the sun come up. Um, the reason I decided to shoot the introduction um, to my project here is because I think this is one of the things that I'm probably best known for, setting the alarm at stupid o'clock and coming out and capturing um, a morning like this. Um, it's quite a special thing for me, so um, it felt like the right thing to do to, to sort of share that part of my life with you for the introduction um, to, to this project. Um, like so many people, um, my life has changed a lot during um, lockdown. Um, after 15 years of being a photographer, I now find myself in a position of being um, a videographer as well. Um, it's work that I'm really enjoying doing, um, far more than I ever thought that I would. And as part of that, I decided that I wanted to do a documentary about what people I know have been through during lockdown. So I put out a call out um, and I expected to sort of maybe get six or eight people that, that would put themselves forward. And actually it was far more than that. And in the end, I, I interviewed 27 um, different people for this project about what they've been through. Um, so those people are from my circle of family and friends, acquaintances and colleagues. And to be honest, I've just been gobsmacked really by what the people that I know have been through over the last six months. So I've put all of that together in a documentary. I've picked out my highlights from each of the interviews and those highlights sort of follow on from here. But you can also um, actually watch um, the full interviews for, for everybody as well, if, if that's something that you want to do. Um, so I hope you enjoy watching this as much as, as I've enjoyed making it. I'd, I've absolutely enjoyed every minute of it um, but I these are people from my circle of, of family and friends acquaintances colleagues etc and my overriding sort of thought from from doing this is that every single one of us has our own circle um, of, of those people too so when you've watched this I, I kind of just want to encourage people to think about their own circle um, and the people around them and take the time to actually check in on those people, make sure they're okay, listen to their stories. Because to be honest, if this project is anything to go by, I think you'd absolutely be amazed by what the people you know have been through during lockdown. Thank you. And then uh, this year was, uh, it started off quite traumatically. I, my mum was one of four sisters. And my mum had died a couple of years ago, but earlier on this year, two of her sisters died. And so I've only got one left. And um, it, that was quite awful. I come from a large family in South Wales, so the funerals were splendid, but you know, that was that's about the height of it. It was really quite bad. And then when I would have been ordinarily going down to Wales quite a lot to stay with my elderly aunt, um, that couldn't happen and so it it was quite difficult I felt I was here all on my own gr grieving for my aunts she was down there she wasn't necessarily on her own but she was shielding she's 85 she was shielding very diligently and so she was on her own as well and and it was quite difficult it was quite difficult so that was the start of lockdown um, and oh, wondering whether this really was a pandemic or whether it was just Boris Johnson's another fuck up. So, you know, it was kind of wondering what to do. Then, uh, then they started saying that all 70 year olds were vulnerable older people, which fucked me off tremendously. I do not think I'm a vulnerable older person. Well, I don't know many old people that think of themselves as vulnerable older people. And my friends in the street here didn't think they were vulnerable either. And they're about the same age as me. So we were long discussions about that. Anyway, uh, lockdown continued and continued and continued. Mostly it was okay, mostly. Every day I would come home and drop the clothes at the front door, go and shower and scrub and do what I could. 
There were people in full masks at work. There were people who didn't seem to give a damn. Uh, young teenagers I would watch saying, well, it's all right, isn't it? if I just get it, I'll just get it, I'll just bring it in, not bothered. And I was astounded that I would come home and listen to a thousand people had died today or, and kids didn't get it. They didn't get it. I've not actually spoken about COVID. I've not actually spoken about the past five months. I lost my godmother and had to watch a funeral online. I lost my dad. And then my appendix burst. <laughs> so I ended up in hospital myself. Every day, worrying about your relatives, about your son. So the million dollar question is, what have your parents been like as teachers? Horrible. Horrible. <laughs> <laughs> Why um, have they been horrible? Well, my parents, they're not teachers. Well, they were great in a way that they kept routine. And if we asked them nicely enough, they would help us out with the tasks that we needed to do. But the majority of the time they were very busy and they were stressed because it was a new environment and my dad and our dad still had to go to work because of him working in the police force. Um, so most of the time it was just us and our mum and she was busy all the time with dial-ins and sometimes she got a bit snappy, but she, they were relatively fine. What do you think, Jim? What were your parents like as teachers? It was um, quite strange because teachers all have been training for years, but they have to become teachers for us and we had to do it by ourselves and read it all by ourselves because they couldn't help us. And they were always busy because they were both key workers and we had, and sometimes when my dad wasn't busy, we could um, ask him some questions and help him. And that was quite often, but it was still, sometimes we couldn't do it. And couldn't ask them questions. So. so now the government have said that you can come out of isolation. Obviously, we still need to socially distance. Is that likely to make you get back in the car and go out and do things a little bit more? Only as much as interacting with my family. I'm still very apprehensive of picking up. Where my, where my life left off beforehand. I had a very full life. I was out every day at lunch clubs and, and meetings and things, and that's not happening. And I don't feel comfortable in even going over in the hill to Arnold to shop. Uh, it's just a bit of a, a, a nervous thing, a bit fear. Because um, it's not the same. I don't, I, I, it, it isn't the same when you're out there, it isn't. Um, I do what I have to do. And, and Elena's now started to take me, she took me down the square so I could get used to, and familiarise with down square shops, what procedures were down there. And I've been a couple of times actually shopping, doing my major shop with her. Um, but going by myself, no. Is that something you think you'll get over? I hope so. I had a distinct apprehension of actually getting in my car to drive again because I'd been so long out of driving and I hadn't even tested how my knee would react. Um, so it's a little bit at the moment, a little bit moving forward, but I hope, I hope I can get over that and move forward because I've always been independent, always. I think this has really knocked that a little bit for me. Um, so I moved in, I think it was about the 28th of, of February with Pete um, and put my house 
on the market for rent, which was problematic because it didn't then let because nobody wanted to move. Um, and so when we came to lockdown, I was stuck in Carlton as far away from my family. I might as well have been a million miles away because I couldn't do anything. I couldn't see them. Uh, and that was hard. And then lockdown happened and, you know, it occurred to me that something incredibly serious was happening and I was about to launch a business that is essentially to do with celebrations and parties and that actually it could appear, well, number one, parties weren't happening. Number two, you know, it could probably appear quite frivolous that you're launching something connected to just purely to celebrations. But I'd worked so hard on getting the business ready and it was it was my baby, you know? I was really proud of how the website was looking. But then lockdown happened and it was kind of like, ah, <laughs> what, do I do, what do I do now? And in a way, I suppose lockdown helped in a degree because I took a step back and I, I was able to think, like, what am I going to do now? You know, I've got this business that I was ready to launch, but what do I do? You know, parties aren't happening. Um, you know, people aren't really going to be wanting to necessarily hear about this at the moment. Groups as well, I guess. Exactly. No groups. You know, I was targeting wedding venues. I wanted to work with event planners. I wanted to work with party planners. I wanted to work with corporates. All the areas that weren't, that weren't happening. But yeah, it kind of said something, I think, about my lockdown when my one highlight of the week was like going food shopping it meant that I could like get dressed and actually go and have interactions with human beings because the only interaction I have was literally like the postman and the dog but my neighbor my ne actually to be fair I so I moved where I live now probably a year ago and where I used to live nobody spoke to anyone whereas here everyone's really friendly so I got speaking to my neighbour who is really lovely and we were like um doing each other shopping and getting bits for each other and like catching up over the fence which which was actually really nice because I actually had someone to talk to <sighs> I actually had someone to talk to in lockdown which was quite nice oh gosh and I not actually told anyone this <laughs> It was just really rubbish to be alone for five months. And like, while I love working from home, like I've got a whole little setup with the desk and everything. And I love the ease of not having to commute an hour there and back every day for work. Um, and, you know, I know you interact with people on work, like in Teams calls and that type of thing. But it's just not the same having like social type of thing so having a neighbour who was really lovely and I could chat to was really nice um but yeah I just I think living alone it, there's been I'd say it's 50 50 percent amazing and 50 50 percent just awful because the first 50 percent of living alone is like I can do what I want I can do when I want I don't have children who are screaming while I'm trying to work I don't have to answer to people I can walk around my house but naked if I wanted to do um but then the other half is is that loneliness is that you don't really see people you don't really talk to people um you, you know I've got my dog for company which I suppose is the good side of things but um that's the thing that this is a once in a century occurrence this is history big history in the making uh, you know I've been doing some research about the Spanish flu pandemic of 1918 to 19 and you know it, I think that we'll have a generation it'll be one of those where we talk about were well, you there you know living history kind of thing but it's really important that we don't neglect the impact that this will have had on so many people and will continue to have into the future it's changed the way that i see things it's changed the way that i go into town for instance um, and i'm pretty robust and pretty 
up for anything but but I know that in, that for our community not just children but children and families it's something that we're going to have to look at really really closely and catch up uh, I don't know I don't know how I feel about all this kind of business of lost learning and catching up you know we had some the vast majority of our pupils really engaged brilliantly with the with the learning we had some great project work and some of the you know some of the stuff that came out of that was 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 really fascinating children learning in a different context and the key worker club was you know children started to behave differently when we got the children back you know we as soon as we could we got them back and and, and but, but but a very different kind of school day but what it meant was that, that, that children were more open, they loved the small classes, and were really much more up for it. So I think there's a, there's a lot of learning for us. When we come back, as I said, we're gonna really focus on emotional health and wellbeing, but also some of that's about what we're teaching and the way we teach it. You know, banging on about English and maths, which we've avoided for the last few years, I have to say, you know, our curriculum has become much more broad and balanced. But I think shorter lessons, uh, Art took a really, you know, art became really important during during the kind of latter end of lockdown and something that we might have neglected in the past. So, yeah, we're going to look at things really differently. It's given us an opportunity, a really good opportunity to look at what we do using online learning, you know, from teachers that, that, that wouldn't have known how to log into a Teams meeting, then sending invitations out for their own Teams meetings, that kind of thing, and Zoom. So... We've learned a lot and I think we really want to apply some of that into the future. Take the best of it. Let me just give you, give you a, a, a background. We obviously have to supply medicines to people, uh, prescribe medication, but during the COVID crisis, people panic. Doctors more or less closed the surgeries and doctors were spewing out prescriptions for two or three months it was like Christmas um, you know when during Christmas time everybody panics and shops are closed very much like that so pharmacies were doing nearly twice the amount of prescriptions so consequently people were waiting for the prescriptions that's the first thing so we had people who were waiting an extra long time so when you imagine you go to queue you two or three people in the, in the pharmacy people waiting outside and then come in to find they didn't have the medicines or, or and, and, and what then led to was stock shortages. So a good example is um, a lot of doctors prescribed lots and lots of inhalers. Now, apart from a normal one or two you get per prescription, they're prescribing three or four, six even, to cover the period because they didn't want to see the patients again. So that led to stock shortages. So we couldn't get hold of many medicines. They ran out. Um, it wasn't because the manufacturers stopped producing it, because stocks ran out. Manufacturers normally keep about two, three months stock in any one time. It's, it's a commercial thing. That ran out straight away. So we couldn't get inhalers, we couldn't get certain medication, blood pressure medication. Um, so that led to a lot of angst, a lot of fear in the community. So we had. But I am concerned as to how we get out of this and whether there are, will ever be, you know, festivals and functions again. And if there aren't, what am I doing? I'm wasting my time. I've got to earn money. I, I need to perhaps retrain. I need to completely rethink my life. It's getting me emotional thinking about it because there's nothing else. There's nothing else that I really want to do or can do. So... Well, it just it crushes your self-worth because if you think that everything you've done, you know, doesn't really have a purpose anymore. So that's why, you know, that's why the lockdown lifts and everything really helped because I felt like I was making people happy again. I think the other thing was once he'd decided um, and he'd spoken to the doctors about the do not resuscitate, um, it decided that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm accepting what's happening and, and it, he went peacefully. Um, you know, there was, there was, from what they say, there was no pain, no discomfort. Um, so, you know, we, we, we take something from that. Um, but then obviously on top of that, we then had to 
deal with the funeral planning, um, which is heartbreaking because at, at the time, depending on the area where you were having the funeral, well, everywhere, you were limited to, to the number of people you could have. And it, it, was, it was awful to sit there and, and try and think who you would invite and who you'd have to say no to. Um, and, you know, I, I spoke to my sister at length about it and it was, you know, do we just have Lisa, myself, my sister and her boyfriend, uh, or do we invite at least some family? Um, there was some family that couldn't make it um, because of their lockdown restrictions. Um, but in the end, we decided to, to invite as many people as we could. Um, and then obviously once once things have become a little bit more, dare I say it, normal whatever normal will be um we will have a a, a, a sort of a proper send-off for him um but yeah it, it was so difficult to try and make a decision as to who you should ask um you know and we, without wanting to upset anyone and you know make anyone feel that they they weren't considered or more in, or less important than anybody else it was it was it, it made a difficult situation even harder Not resigned myself is not the right phrase because it's not a negative thing. I think what it has done for me is consolidated that business has to change. Businesses can't go just flip back to exactly how they were. Everybody's, you know, all the places are opening back up again, pubs and restaurants and things, aren't they? But with restrictions in place and so on and so forth. And and I think um, I have started networking online. So one of the, the one of my mentors who runs a national networking company, very quickly started offering online meetings. Um, and I went into the online world because I, I did a few weeks where I didn't do any networking, um, and went into the online stuff and really enjoyed it. So what it has meant is that I can there aren't any boundaries anymore with um, people. You know, geography isn't a, isn't an issue. So I've been talking to people all over the country on a weekly basis and they're getting to know about me and my business. Um, and also it's I've developed online stuff so that the, the stuff that I'd already get got, I'd, I fine-tuned it. And I'm quite happy with how things are working. All, all sense of rules and normal parenting sort of went out of the window quite often and I'd I'd have those oh, I'm failing I'm failing as a mum here moments but again I just had to do what I had to do I would set the alarm for six I'd get myself looking relatively presentable and, and get logged on the computer for half past and try and do a bit of work while the child was either still asleep or watching some sort of CBBS thing upstairs um, he'd eventually decide he wanted some breakfast he's, he's a bit like a, a teenager actually he's, he's three going on 13 I think he'd eventually come downstairs around half eight um, have breakfast and he was to be fair to him he was brilliant at entertaining himself um, and he just used to get on with it but but having said that, work were brilliant as well. They were really supportive. So, so yes, I was logged on by half six, but I was able to sort of switch off the computer half one, two o'clock and just call it a day. Um, and people in the institution knew that there were people working all sorts of balmy, flexible hours, people working weekends, people working evenings. Um, but there was a, a real sort of feeling that you weren't just alone <laughs> at those times in the morning. Yeah, I've loved it. I'm so grateful that Ollie's not got to secondary school yet and he's wanting to be out all the time with his mates. He's quite happy if we stop at home or if we just do family stuff. Um, so for me, it's been extra time that I've got to spend with my kids and I've had the pressure of... Um, <laughs> you're a monkey. Mommy. What, darling? I want my food. Get it then. Yeah, so for me it's been more that we've had the extra time together and then I've had, because the, normally the thing that would stress me out at the school holidays is what I feel like I'm expected to fit in for them. So I would normally have like a schedule of who we need to see and 
when we need to see them and where we could go that's not going to cost us an arm and a leg because we're a big family. Um, and then I'd pray that it was going to be sunny on them days so that we didn't have to change our plans and do something that was going to cost me an arm and a leg. Um, so I, for me, it's like we've had all this extra time, but the things that would normally make me think, oh, God, it's going to be a nightmare, they've been took away because I've not been allowed to take them out everywhere. I've not been allowed to spend money. We've actually saved money because we've we've all of the we've had no diesel we've had no football we've had no takeaways so all of them extra things that are the luxuries they've not been there for us so it's made us appreciate them things a little bit more but when we started to get back to being more normal i did feel quite anxious because it made me realize how much i used to pack into a week and how much i had actually been doing and how much happier i felt and more content that life were a bit more basic so it has made me reevaluate a few of the things that I do so now I don't so in my current role as, as the manager um, for the dog control service um, I also work as a staff officer um, for the whole of CP which um, effectively um, is within the uniform services although I no longer patrol on the front line um, due to the pandemic and, and the guidelines put in place by the government um, that did leave us in a position where a number of our frontline staff were having shield um, doesn't change the fact that we still have a responsibility and we you know we've got a duty to fulfill um, so I certainly put my uniform on 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 many occasions throughout the lockdown to to fill the gap so to speak um, which was interesting because not only did I realise how rusty I was, um, I did get to do something that was incredibly rewarding, which is not necessarily a top priority uh, in a uniform role. As much as you want to help out, um, you know, local citizens, and and when you work in the neighbourhood, you've got your you've got your local um, sort of care homes and that where you often visit and help out where you can, but it's really rewarding when you're turning up to a property to give someone the medication because they're simply too scared to leave the house. Um, so for me, it was really rewarding having the, having the, uh, the ability to go out and do that. I think the only um, thing that I was slightly disappointed um, was that the, the hospital, I didn't get a letter saying you are one at risk. Um, it was just that my employer said, you need to, to go home. Um, I've had nothing from the hospital um, saying whether I am at risk. Um, I think I would have liked that reassurance. Mm -hmm. But then again, my, last, my chemo was, was four or five years ago. So just that little bit of information that would have said, you know, if you had chemo up to two years ago, you are at risk, but anything more than that, you, you know, you sort of like carry on as normal ish. Um, I think that is the only th only underlying thing, um, because obviously once you've had cancer, you think it's going to come back one day, and if it does come back and it comes back now, what am I going to do? You know, how how am I going to get the help that I need? But you obviously don't think about that every day. It's it's just in those dark moments. But apart from that, no, it's been a very interesting few months. Um, I've achieved a lot that I wanted to do, made some big decisions that really have needed to be made for probably three, four, five years. Um, and I've managed to paint my kitchen, which is good. How <laughs> fast it progressed, uh, the virus, uh, to Italy and uh, my first concern was with uh, my good friend over there Roberto Albughetti uh, who lives in Bergamo and uh, we were all uh, anxious to know how they were coping there and I was seeing what was on the TV what was on the news and how the hospitals there were were trying to cope um, and it was uh, very emotional you know to watch things like that um, with the doctors and nurses speaking really honestly and directly and uh, so it uh, really hits home 
and um, I it was quite difficult really difficult to take in um, all that you know what I've what my father has said all, all, all through from childhood is you know your number one in life is your health and well-being because when you're sick you can't look after your family and loved ones and you know it's it's just the most important thing so your immediate reaction is you know your family wherever they are you know in the UK and the world and uh... up until I think it was the Easter holidays um my middle son in secondary school he really really struggled because everything that he went on he was just being overloaded with all this work but didn't know what he was doing we couldn't get on and then the software wasn't working properly but then after the Easter holidays they came back and says right this is a timetable for you so then he knew each morning when he woke up what lessons he had to do and things and he only ever spent the an hour, two hours every day, every morning, doing it, do it, doing schoolwork. Mm. But it was just what was what was set, and I wasn't going to push them to do any more, because at the end of the day, we're in unprecedented times, and it's you know difficult as it is without having full on blown meltdowns and arguments because I'm not understanding the work and he's not understanding it. So I just kind of let them take it at their own pace, and then. The other two, theirs was all on um, Class Dojo. And the school was really great at setting work and things like that. But again, I had trouble logging into their maths work, uh, which I was quite glad about because I don't like maths myself. <laughs> um, but then at the end of it, we kind of got better. Well, we got better at a routine with that. And it will be like once, whilst one was doing TT Rockstars, another would be doing written work in the book and then there would be um then obviously they would take over because it was trying to spread that time of the laptop but i also noticed that if they didn't get the work done in the morning it was all hell broke loose in the afternoon because they didn't want to do it in the afternoon they wanted to get it done get it out of the way So obviously lots of Prides across the UK were either cancelled or postponed. Um, Nottingham Pride announced that they were going to have to unfortunately cancel until next year, um, which was, you know, nobody wants to hear that news, but the committee did what they needed to do in light of the current situation. Um, so they made the announcement. Um, we thank them publicly because we think the work they do is amazing because they are volunteers. Um, and they contacted me and said, you know, what do you think about maybe doing something virtually? So I was like, I definitely want to be involved in that. And I think from the start, they wanted to do something virtually with a difference. So it wasn't them in their living room with a laptop. It was like, right, we're going to bring in this company that are going to film it. We're going to have lights. We're going to go all out. So I was like, I really want to be involved. <laughs> um, so they were like, we'd like to use the council house to do the filming. So, you know, I was like, OK, I'll take that back to councillors. So we had a meeting and, yeah, we got the sign off to do that. Yeah. Um, so we did the film in two weeks before it went out um, and it was quite surreal because it was my first time back in the city in a place of work so I was really excited just to go to the council house um, and I think that there was that realisation about the changes that have been made because there was social distancing, hand sanitizer, all the things that you hear about but for me it was the first time that I'd seen that in a place where I'd go all the time and just pop in. Um, so the way they did it was really, really good. Um, and yeah, as far as I'm aware, we've got over 5,000 views um, and it's still online now. So I thought it was brilliant. And I have to give all the credit to that, to the committee. They did amazing. But I think, I think I, f I feel in terms of my mood and my um, kind of just my well-being really I think I feel I feel I'm okay <laughs> I have a little crying occasionally but I'm I'm okay because I feel very positive about my my new job and I'm you know I still talk to my friends and you know all of that still happens but 
there is this overriding kind of sense that I've missed an opportunity to kind of, to just say goodbye to certain people. And there's certain people I feel like I won't see again. Um, and, I'm, and I won't get the chance to, to give a big hug to. And that, that continues to make me sad. <laughs> it does. It continues to make me sad because I think, I, I just think that there's some incredibly wonderful people that I've worked with, um, staff and citizens, and some people that I've really, really, you know, loved to bits. And it just seems a, uh, it just seems sad for me that uh, that that's the way it had to be. So yeah. People started to question whether events should go ahead, and and I remember sort of mid March I did a, a conference. Um, and there were two or three hundred people at this conference in a room and, and we were talking about it and socially distancing and um, but it, it felt very strange and I look back now and it's weird to me that that even went ahead because we I don't know the world was sort of changing quite quickly but it, it just sort of all seemed to happen so fast after that in a, in a very short space of time a lot of work was cancelled and and in the space of a few weeks, it literally felt like everything that I'd worked so incredibly hard to build sort of crumbled down around my ears, really. And a lot of work was cancelled. Um, and interestingly, the national lockdown actually happened on my wife's birthday, which was surreal. Um, and at that point, you know, I'd gone from having a very busy diary and lots of work booked in to having virtually nothing. And, you know, she'd been sent home from work. The place she worked had, had sort of closed. And suddenly we were just at home with no, no idea whatsoever what, what was going to happen sort of moving forward. You know, she was likely to be redeployed, but we didn't know that, so that was home. And if I'm honest, I kind of felt really cast adrift. And she'd probably hate me for saying this but in some ways I kind of felt like my space had been invaded because I'd been used to having the home space and suddenly she was there all the time and neither of us like everybody really I suppose didn't have a, a scooby-doo what what we were doing and, and what was going to happen and I think for for a while there I felt a bit sorry for myself and that's not not the person I am I've, I've kind of I've rebuilt my life many times um, as an adult and I'm used to doing that and I'm used to kind of picking myself up and dusting myself off but I think I had to go through a period at that point where I kind of did feel sorry for myself a little bit and thought right what am I going to do? We, were, we expected it but didn't expect it in the most silliest way ever like we we were having a really small wedding anyway, so we only wanted our intimate people there. So when they gave us the offer saying, oh, you can still have the wedding, but it will only be a limited people, was like, okay, like we can do with that. But then as it went on, and obviously they were saying, it's not gonna happen at all. We were just like, oh, but there's nothing they can do. They were absolutely fabulous. We were we were one of the really like understanding ones saying, it's you didn't create COVID-19, what can we do? So we get it. It was just a bit pants, but. We got it. <laughs> so what did you do on the day then that you should have got married? We actually were really cheeseball. Um, and we went to we went to the venue, so we had a proper, we took a date and we had a full day of wedding, what we would like to do, just an us day. Um, so we went to the wedding venue in the morning, sat outside, looked at it. <laughs> sat outside, looked at it. And then we just went to like the garden centre and just did stuff that we wanted to do. We spent a lot of money because it was like, this can be our wedding present. <laughs> for our fake wedding but yeah we we just made it a, a day for just us two we had a nice little we had a takeaway in because she couldn't go out but it was just a nice little day for us two we made it as special as possible I was, I was supposed to be leaving the the venue at the end of april and going to a new venue uh to start a, you know to be a, a venue director uh 
at another venue. So yeah, it was it was one of those things. It was all you know, it, it was all sorted. I'd signed contracts. They'd signed contracts. I'd handed my resignation in, uh, and then on the Wednesday after uh, lockdown, uh, I got an email to say, "Can you give me a call?" I rang them and they said, "All oh, plans have changed. Uh, they were supposed to be taking over another venue." They clearly weren't going to do that in that in that situation, uh, and so I was uh, I was told that there wasn't a job for me, uh, which was uh, scary, uh, worrying, frustrating, upsetting. Uh, you know, the, we were we were due to, to have another baby in the next couple of weeks, uh, and you know I faced the prospect then of, of, of being unemployed within six weeks. So it it wasn't a great uh, situation. Uh, uh, there was some turn and throwing at, at the venue initially that I wasn't given my job back straight away. Uh, I, I, uh, I had to uh, to fight for that. You know, I had probably five or six sleepless nights, literally sleepless nights. Didn't sleep for, for almost a week uh, until the, you know the the, the the director that I worked with for, for a long time agreed that I could go back and uh, you know could could have my job back. Uh, so it was it was a really challenging, upsetting, frustrating time. Not just for me, uh, subsequently I found out that my dad hadn't slept for a week because he was so worried about the situation. She Sarah was due to give birth any time then, so there was obviously a lot of stress. And, and actually, within 36 hours of finding out that I had got my job back, Sarah gave birth. So, you know, it was obviously a, a, you know, a stressful period for the whole family. The lockdown came on the Monday evening and I had a midwife appointment on the Tuesday and that appointment was, because that was my next midwife appointment from when kind of it all started to get a bit more real. And I remember going in and it was just so strange. So I, I knocked on the door and um, the door was locked. Um, somebody came to the door in full kind of PPI, asked who I was, um, went back inside to make sure I was allowed in. So then I was kind of allowed in as the only one in there or went into the midwife's office. And it's all very strange, like trying to have a midwife's appointment while you're trying to socially distance when she's got to take your blood pressure and things like that. So you're kind of like skipping around the room. And it just, it just felt so strange. I think that was the point that it really kind of hit home that it was like a real serious thing um, because we were talking about, oh, who's going to go into the hospital with you? And obviously I said, my husband, Jonathan. Um, but I had a little girl and I'm like, oh, who's looking after your little girl? And I said, well, her auntie, does she live in the same household? Uh, well, no, she doesn't, but there isn't anyone else that lives in the same household. Oh, well, she won't be able to come around then. And it was just kind of, I remember coming out at that appointment feeling really upset because I was like, well, I can't, I can't go on my own. I can't, I can't do this. And, and, um, and what was the other thing from, from there? So, oh, also, um, I was told that Jonathan would be allowed to come to the birth, but it'd have to go straight, go leave straight afterwards. So I was like, oh, so will he even get to hold the baby? Or, you know, so literally will the baby be born, he has to leave. I was like, oh no, he'll, he'll get to, he'll get to hold, hold him or her, but, um, but then he'll have to go straight away. So it'll probably just be like a few minutes after she's born, he'll be straight out. And I remember thinking, oh, that's gonna be really, really strange. Um, but it turned out when, when we did actually go in, like he, he could stay for a little bit longer, he just couldn't come up to the ward. But, um, but yeah, it all started to feel a bit strange kind of from the lockdown being announced on the Monday, from that Tuesday, it was all really, really weird. We were worried about everything in the UK. Obviously, we only had TV coverage to go on, but what it appeared to be like was that we had this severe lockdown here in Spain, in Valencia, and nobody's really doing much in the UK. Um, it was just advised that you should stay at home if you can rather than being told and after our type of lockdown it was we were of the attitude of what, what the hell are you, are you playing at what are you doing just you know go home stay at home wear masks clean your hands do all this um but of course we've only got the media to go on i sort of felt angry that people in the UK didn't seem to be taking the pandemic as, as seriously as we were in Spain. And it was a bit frightening. You know, I was worried for my family and friends who were still out and about going to the shops. You know, they... And then obviously, as we realised it was here to stay a little bit more, um, all my exams went, went remote. Um, so... I ended up doing my exams online from our back bedroom, which is crazy because that's not how I expected to finish 
finish my degree I didn't get to I didn't get to see my friends that I'd made when while I'd been over there I, I still haven't seen them since our exams in March I, I'm probably not going to get to do a graduation or do anything to celebrate so whilst I finished and passed and got through the hard bit of doing work from home uni from home and doing the exams from home it it's almost like an anti-climax the idea that I can't just be like right let's have a celebration because now I finally allowed a life again <laughs> things aren't things aren't normal and I don't don't know when they will be don't know when But I, I just, I wanted really to say thank you. Thank you so much to the people that have been interviewed for this project. Um, I am absolutely blown away. And I say blown away a lot, and I, I really mean it in a heartfelt way, that I, I have sat down with, with all of these people and, and talked to them. I say interviewed them, but it kind of feels like a chat. And I've talked to them about their lives during lockdown. And I genuinely, genuinely am overwhelmed by their, their willingness to tell me their innermost thoughts and the things that have happened to them and to make themselves vulnerable in that process. And to actually give me a real heartfelt account of what they have been through during lockdown good or bad you know there have been positives for people there have been some horrible you know things that people have been through that I've kind of and I felt honored to sit and listen to people kind of get in some instances really get stuff off their chest and I think surprise themselves with the things that they have said and at the moment I don't know what's going to happen with this project but I feel like it all of the stories are, are really important ones to tell. And I feel like whether this is important now or in 10 years time, when we all kind of reflect on 2020 and I'm gonna say it, the shit storm, it feels like it's it's been. But I do, I just, I want to say thank you. I I didn't think people would be as open and honest with me as they have been. And I'm honored that people have chosen me to do that with and have agreed to do it um, and I feel like in doing that they've made me a part of a really special moment and I can't wait to share this project with people.